Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sunrise Apologetics. <clears throat> I'm recording this on what they call Black Friday, and uh, I am not out with the unwashed masses uh, trying to grab uh, slightly discounted merchandise that you can now buy on Amazon. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but if you are, no judgment. Um, but uh, I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I uh, feasted on turkey and gravy and mashed potatoes and stuffing and scallop potatoes and uh, uh, let's see what else do we have uh, we had roast beef we had um, uh, we had all the pies we had all the uh, uh, tea and uh, all the uh, gravy and so uh, the down here in the south where the gravy flows like wine uh, you can uh, <laughs> put it on anything so and we did but I hope that you and yours had a wonderful Thanksgiving um, I just wanted to uh, go over a text uh, today that I felt would be helpful for uh, the coming months over the Christmas season and as the election gets certified, whichever way, um, and, and a lot of people are going to be upset no matter what happens, um, I thought this text would be good to go over. I've kind of talked about uh, this text before, but um, there's some things in here I think will be useful uh, for you. It is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 starting in verse 23, and I'll kind of take this thought by thought as we go. Um, verse 23 says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Now, Paul, the apostle, is writing to a church that's having some issues and struggles fitting into their culture and into their community. They've been saved out of extreme uh, pagan ideas and beliefs and practices, and they're trying to reconcile their normal way of life with this new Christian faith, or is this sinful, is that? These Some things obviously are sinful, other things not so obvious. And so Paul is uh, writing to help them. And he, and he begins out with, all things are lawful. And and kind of what we're seeing today with uh, these political ideas, and, and especially wearing the mask, I think is the biggest one. You have people who are just so bent on, you must wear it, you must do it, it's going to save lives. And then you have people who are just so distraught about putting that on, and it's a sign of submission. And um, and, and I, I'm really, I feel balanced in the middle on this thing. I feel like, yes, a mask does help if you were near somebody, or if you yourself had uh, the virus, um, that it would help you to uh, not spread it or not get it. But th at the same time, I, I feel that if you don't want to wear one, then you shouldn't be made to. And certainly you should not be fined uh, for that. Um, in fact, my kind of rule of thumb, and, and this is what we do at our church, is if you think you're sick, then you should be home. You should not be around public people. And, and we should be doing this with every illness, the flu, the basic head cold, I think we live in a culture now where where we used to live in a culture, especially in the South, where the, the the pendulum is so heavy and it just it just it takes so much effort to push it in a direction that when we do, it just it doesn't stay balanced. It does not stay in the middle. It swings to the other side, and it's very hard to get it back. We used to live in a culture that oh, if you didn't come into work or if you didn't show up at church, even if you're oh you're sick, like come to church, you lazy bum, or go to work, you you're, you know you're just sorry. And so people felt pressured to, oh, even though I might be ill, or even if I have a low-grade fever, I got to get up and go to work, I got to uh, go to church, I got to make sure I fulfill these family obligations. And that's just wrong. I mean, this entire pandemic, our church has not had a major problem because we put in that one rule for the good of the church, if you believe you are sick or have been exposed to somebody who's sick, then maybe you need to stay home and catch the service online. And that's really helped us out. So that's kind of my personal feelings. So I feel a little balanced on the mask, but also I feel a little more extreme. I think if you're sick with anything, you shouldn't be out. You shouldn't be at Walmart. You shouldn't be anywhere. You should be home getting better. Um, and that's kind of a, I know, I know that's not possible for every single person. There's, there's issues. I get that. Um, but in general, I think, you know, you, you, you have to take care of other people by um, um, doing your part. So that's kind of where I'm at on that. So when we talk about all things are being lawful, all things are lawful in the eyes of God, but they're not helpful. All things are lawful, but they don't build up. And that's what we're seeking to do is build others up. Verse 24, let not one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. See, this is not about you and I thinking about ourselves. It is about thinking about those around us. God did. Jesus did. If he wasn't going to, if he didn't seek the good of his neighbors, the world, he would have stayed in glory. He wouldn't have come down and been sacrificed and crucified and then and rise again. 
He sought the good of his neighbor. We must follow his example. And how can we seek the good of our neighbor? The good of my neighbor is not exposing them to a virus I might have. I agree. But the good for my neighbor is also not putting unfair and unjust restrictions upon them just to serve me. Paul had an issue in verse 25. It says, eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. See, in Corinth, they had meat often just sitting in the market that was being offered to an idol or or it was said the meat was provided by a false god. I mean, this would be like in Walmart if you went up to uh, the meat counter and they said, oh, this T-bone steak uh, or this sirloin, this has been provided by the God of Islam or the god of the Hindus, or, or, or this false god maybe you've never even heard of, would you, how would you feel eating that? And what if they all had that label? What if they were all offered to a false god? You wouldn't be able to buy food. So Paul's saying, hey, listen, you have to use your conscience on this. You have to go with your heart. You can eat what's sold in the meat market, but if your conscience allows... Verse 26, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It doesn't matter if other, if other people attribute their, ide- their ideas and their attributes and their food and, their, and the, the work of their, of their fruit of their labors to false gods. It belongs to the one true God. It doesn't belong to them. And it can't belong to them ever. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so you, you don't, don't fear, Christian. You cannot eat something and actually be giving it to a false god, that false god doesn't exist, hence the term false. Now we get a little even a little more personal in verse 27. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat what is ever, whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Basically, if they if a Christian was trying to make a disciple and that disciple invited him to their house for dinner, but put the meat in front of them and said, oh yes, this meat we got from the great God of, of, of Baal, Alfred this to us, or whatever the pagan God might be. And Paul's saying, it's okay, eat. Verse 28, but if someone in form says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of someone else's conscience. So if someone else, a fellow Christian, was going, hey, listen, that meat, man, I just can't believe you're doing that. I can't believe you're, you know, you're, 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 you're eating that meat that has been offered to that false god. I'm just stumbling over this. Or you're the pastor of the church, or you're an elder in the church. How can you do this? For the sake of their conscience, don't do it. I do not mean your conscience, but his, in verse 30, for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? It's not. You are protecting somebody else's conscience when you partake with liberty. Guys, yours is already secure in Christ. And one of the best examples about this is alcohol. Because, and, it's, and it's one of the most disputed things, especially in Southern culture. Because Southern culture says alcohol is bad. It's a sin. It's something that evil people do. Whereas Paul said to Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. Jesus turned water into wine. And, and, and you find an issue in Southern culture about reconciling these two things. Like, yeah, I know God said that, but it's still sinful. You shouldn't do it. And, and that doesn't make any sense. I think about it this way. Paul said, take a little for your stomach. So have a little for your stomach. But if someone else come to you and said, man, I just, I just I don't know about that preacher, or I don't know about that elder in the church, or I don't know about that Christian. I just don't know how you could do that. For their sake... Could you take that alcohol and pour it down the drain? I'm going to submit to you that if somebody else was offended and you are not able to ease their offense by pouring it down the drain, then you do have a problem with alcohol. Everyone who tells me that, oh, I just I drink it for socially or I drink it for fun or it just tastes good. If you get offended that someone else doesn't want you to do it, then you do have a problem. Because God said that all things are lawful, but are they helpful? That's the thing to consider here. Are you doing the good of your neighbor? Or are you saying, no, I want for me? See, that's the question here. It's a question of selfishness versus righteousness. We're not talking about whether or not alcohol is truly sinful or not. That's not the point. That doesn't matter. We're not talking about whether or not a mask is sinful or not. That's not the point. The point is, are you doing for others rather than yourself? That's what following God is. That's what being a true Christian is. James chapter 1, pure religion. Do for widows and orphans in their trouble and keep yourself from sin. It's not about getting your respect, getting your rights, doing all this stuff. No. 
doing for God. Now, doing for God means that you do fight for liberty and you do fight for the rights of others. But not for yourself. It's selfishness. Verse 30, if I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? And this is the biggest thing. Why am I denounced for what I'm doing in the Lord, what I believe is right, what the scripture gives me the right to do, and I am denounced for it. And we saw this. I am so disappointed with mainstream Christianity, especially on social media, Twitter, YouTube, because we had the opportunity, the worst pandemic in a hundred years, we had the wonderful opportunity of God to show the world what it means to be the church, to show the world what it means to have faith, to show the world what it means to stand with Christ, and instead we bickered on whether or not people should wear masks, attend YouTube church, and whether or not your church should meet. Foolishness silliness, destruction. My verse for the pandemic has always been Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're doing what you're doing, if your church is not meeting physically because you just believe this is the best way for us to serve Christ, amen. If your church is saying, hey, we think we should wear a mask, we got a lot of elderly people, people at risk, we just think it's the best way to love our neighbors and, and serve Christ, amen. And if you think the opposite of those things, and you think those because you're trying to serve Christ the best way you know how, according to scripture, amen. The problem is, is when we go, I'm right, I know what's best, we get away from God. We get away from what it means to truly follow him. We do for ourselves. Look what I have done. Look what I can do. Look what I've accomplished. Foolishness foolishness are you doing for the good of your neighbor and then we get to my favorite verse in all of scripture so whether you eat or drink whether you whatever you do do all to the glory of god whether you wear a mask whether you attend church whether you go to youtube sermons whether you're locked in your house whether you're running the streets freely if you're not doing it to the glory of god it is sin and that's what we got to understand christians We're all about getting our rights and respect, but does it glorify God? And I promise you, you can use this as a yardstick, as a guide to every area in your life. Because the Bible doesn't tell you exactly what, where to live, who to marry, how many children to have, you know, what career to have, what college to go to. It doesn't tell you any of these things. And I, I tell this to young people all the time. Here's the best way you can do it. If you care about God being glorified, about achieving your purpose in this life, in this creation, then do ask yourself this question, which of these two choices most glorifies my creator? Which of my options most brings glory to God that is usually the one that God wants you to do? He's a jealous God, as the Old Testament says. He wants his glory and he will receive it. He will get it. Are you giving it to him? See, because we can run around, complain about everything. But if we're not seeking to glorify God, if we're not seeking to do our actual purpose, what we were actually put here to do, then we've already failed. We are the immature ones. We are the ones in sin. And we need to repent. Verse 32, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but uh, that of many, that they may be saved. Let me read that verse again, verse 33. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do. We're so all about offending people, aren't we? We're so about, I'm going to do what I want, and I don't care what who anybody says about it. We're all about seeking our advantage. This is the flesh. Instead, we should not seek our own advantage, but that of the many. Now, a lot of people are going to tell you that loving your neighbor and seek in the advantage of many, oh, you got to strap this plastic mask on your face. No, it's not. See, because Paul gives us the very end here of this chapter, that of the many, that they may be saved. We're talking about the glorification of souls, those uh, lost being brought into the kingdom of God. That's what's important here, not whether or not you wear a physical mask, because God is less concerned about your physical life, and he is far more concerned about where you spend eternity. Christian, don't don't get wrapped up in the cares of this world. They're folly. They will be burned with fire. They will be destroyed. Your care, your concern, your focus should be eternity. And all those who are going to hell, whom God has declared that you should preach the gospel to in hopes they might be saved. We're going to fight about masks? We're going to fight about YouTube church? We're going to fight about 
all these other things, none of which are important. Not important as compared to what it means to be saved. And then the last verse I want to hit here is actually the next chapter, but please remember, chapter and verses are not in the original scripture. Paul was still continuing with his thought here. Chapter 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That's what's important here. Church, we got to sit back and ask ourselves this question. Are we doing what we're doing because it's what Jesus would do? Now, a lot of people come up and say, oh, this is what Jesus would do. But we have an entire book. In fact, 66 separate ones exactly telling us what Jesus would do. We should know better than any one church. Christians, we should know what Jesus would do. And we know. He reached out and touched those who were sick with leprosy, a disease so so vital, so evil, that it could afflict anyone who came into contact with it, young or old. Jesus reached out and he healed them. Jesus sat with the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the, the low lives, the scum, everyone else in the city who thought, oh, and those people are just bad. Jesus, he sat with them. But he also sat with the Pharisees and the religious leaders because they needed mercy and grace just as much as the tax collector. This is what I hope your church is doing. I truly do. That, that your church is seeking to bring glory to God in your community the best way that you can. And I do not mean following every single thing a government official says, your governor of your state says, the president says. It does not compare to what your God says. I mean, the very name of God should, should lower any other official underneath him. He's God, creator, master, Lord, savior, this is the one you need to follow. And, 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 I, and I think, and I'll say it again and again, we don't know his will because we don't read his book. The best we do is little devotions and short stories and little cutesy you know, picture books for children. How many times have you heard the story of Jonah and the big fish, but you've never heard the end of Jonah? See, we don't like the end of Jonah. Jonah has a nice three-part structure there. The chapters one, two, three, gets sent to Nineveh. I don't want to go. Chapter two, in the belly of the fish. Chapter three, spat out, preaches to Nineveh, Nineveh repents. Success! A lot of, a lot of Christians say, let's write all those numbers down. But chapter four, Jonah is angry, sitting on the hill, wishing Nineveh would be destroyed. And God takes away his one piece of shade. And then God confronts Jonah. Should I not have saved that city with many people and much livestock? And then it ends. See, Christians, that's where we are. This is not going to end in a nice three-part structure with a happy ending. No, this is going to go on. We'll be sitting there on the hill looking at our world, and our world may be destroyed. It might repent. I don't know. But what Jonah needed to learn was that the worship of God, the faith in God, the trust in God, that was far more important than any physical thing. In church, that's what you and I have to learn. It is so much more important. It is so much more glorious. It is so much better than anything else in this life. Why? Why waste time fighting and, and, and arguing with other people about things that not truly matter? If you're going to fight and argue, fight over the word. Argue over the, over the gospel. Do your convincing that Jesus Christ is Lord, not whether or not a person should wear a mask. The conversation from the church should be Christ, and it saddens me when it's not. Because all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but they don't build up. Are you seeking for the good of yourself or for the good of your neighbor? If someone says to you, hey, this thing is sinful, then for that person's conscience, refrain. But you have liberty in Christ. But that liberty is found in the glorification of your creator. It's not found in you getting to do what you want. It's found in God. And see, the, the, the purpose here is to give thanks. We just spent a day yesterday celebrating what it means to give thanks. But a far better thing, a far, far more glorious thing, is to glorify the Lord properly. To give him his due to be an imitator of those who are like Christ and to be an imitator of Christ himself. This is your chief purpose. And this is why you should give thanks, Christian. You are here 
to glorify God. That's the most important thing. That's the only thing that matters, and that's the thing that you should seek today. Bring glory and honor to God.